So let's take a look at a final exam. This is from Calculus 2. You might call it Advanced Calculus. At Iowa State, we call it Math 166. And this is from Fall 2022. Now there's a, a saying, final exams are like a box of chocolate. You never know what you're going to get. Which is to say that they're comprehensive. And so we really could be tested on anything and maybe we'll be tested on almost everything. But you will notice, as you look at finals, certain topics tend to come up again and again. And so even though it, it is comprehensive, there are things that we can do and certain things to look for. And it's good to go through and look at old exams. So let's go through and do this one here. And uh, well, of course, we start as always. We put our name on it because we want the credit. Of course we do, of course we do. And off we go. Number one, consider the circle with parametric equations, x of t is one minus sine t, y of t is one minus cosine t, and t goes zero to two pi. And it says, find the area of the surface generated by rotating the circle about the x-axis. The circle generates the surface of a donut-shaped solid without a hole. So this will be unholy, is what that says. Okay, well, we don't need to get too far into the details. What do we have? Uh, we can say a few things about what's going on here. So if we think about what's happening here in the x-y plane, you'll notice we have ones, and then there's sine t's and cosine t's, and so what's happening is you have this point 1, 1, which corresponds to the one here and the one here. And the sine t cosine t then tells us that we're going to move around the unit circle in some fashion. And uh, so essentially what's going to happen is we, we pull a circle like this. So there we go. So that's our circle. Now, of course, we knew it was a circle ahead of time because it told us it was a circle. All right. Now, what's going to happen here? Well, we're going to rotate about the x-axis. Okay, good. Now we have a plan. Okay, so what's our plan? Well, if we're after surface area, the idea is we're going to take a small piece of our surface, and then we spin. And so we spin it, and it forms a little tiny ribbon. Okay, so the question is, what's our area of our ribbon? Well, if we break it into pieces, we essentially have a couple of key parts to have. You need to know how far we are from where we're spinning. So in our case, that would be y. And uh, that acts like the radius. We then say, well, look, it's like the, think of it as you have a radius of y and then you have a circle, what's the circumference of that circle? Well, it's 2 pi the radius, so there's 2 pi times y. And then, what do you do? We're going to multiply it by the small bit of length here. Okay, so I'm going to put length in parentheses, because that part needs some explanation. And finally, we're going to add our pieces together. And uh, so that's the integral. Okay, so reasoning through, that's what our, our basic thing will look like. Now, there's uh, details, of course, and there's always details. So let's talk about our various details. Uh, well, one thing I, I should have pointed out, of course, is from start to end. Okay, so when we're setting this integral up, we say, okay, start and end where? Well, we start and end with 0 and 2 pi. Great. So 0, 2 pi. And those are our bounds. Different from this 2 pi, that's the number associated with length. Because it's, it's associated with the, the circumference. Now for y, the goal is we're going to put everything in terms of t. So y is 1 minus cosine t. All right, good. And then length. Now, this is arc length of a parametric curve. 
So this would be normally square root of x prime squared plus y prime squared dt. Kind of vaguely speaking, the, the x prime squared plus y prime squared is more or less saying, okay, I'm starting here, I'm ending over here, you know, change in x, change in y, and uh, you, you have the, the hypotenuse, it's kind of like the hypotenuse, and then of course you have to scale it by the right amount, that's where the dt comes from. And of course that's what we have, you know, right, because we have parametric curves. All right, so what is the dx? Well, the derivative of negative sine would be negative cosine, square that, y prime, derivative of uh, negative cosine is positive sine. And then also, of course, we had the ones, but there is a ones or zeros. And so sine t squared and dt. Well, cosine squared plus sine squared. <gasps> I know that one. I know it. It's the one. It is the one. Okay, that's great. Which means, well, this is a lovely integral. Everything's nice. So we say, okay, let's just go through and integrate. We have our constant, 2 pi. The integral of 1 minus cosine t will be t minus, and of course the integral of cosine is sine. Evaluate from 0 to 2 pi. Well, plug in 2 pi. We'll get 2 pi times 2 pi is 4 pi squared. And then sine of 2 pi zero. Plug in zero, zero. Sign of zero, zero. And so, there's our answer. Four pi squared. Done. Done. And that's all we needed, right? Was all we needed was the area of the surface that was generated. Ah, what a wonderful problem. We're off to a great start. Woohoo! Number two. A snow storage piled against a wall, held between two fences, has the form of a trapezoidal prism. And, uh, well, prism is just a fancy way of saying it's like a rectangle, but then you cut off something at an angle. All right. It's 10 feet wide, 10 feet high. In the vertical direction, its trapezoidal cross-section has a width of 16 feet at the base and 10 feet at the top. Now, it might help for us to sort of add in some hidden edges just to sort of get a sense of for what's really going on. So we could add on the ones in the background, and then we could say, well, it's really 10 feet and 10 feet, and here is 16 feet. Okay, so we have this three-dimensional shape. So if we had extended here, so we, we sort of had a box where we cut off this portion. All right. Now... If the snow has a density of 20 pounds per cubic foot, how much work was done in building up the snow with snow brought from ground level? Okay, work. Aha! <laughs> it's a physics problem. We know physics. We might be taking it right now even. So how do we do work problems? Well, the answer is we turn into little pieces of work and we add our little pieces together. Okay, so what's our idea? Well, we're going to slice. And we slice in sort of the direction of gravity. So in other words, when I slice here, I'm going to take a slice that will look something like this. Okay, so there's my slice. And then the question is, well, how much work did it take to get that slice moved up? Okay, so what do we need to know? We need to know the volume of the slice. When we times it by the density, that gives us the, the pounds, which is the force. And then we times that by how far up it is. Force times distance gives us work. And that gives us that amount. Okay. Cool, 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 cool. All right. So let's talk about this slice. Well, uh, there's a couple of things that are pretty easy. First off, one side is 10. Not so hard. The height, well, it's a small change in y. And I'm going to think of y as in the y direction. And then the width, well, that's, we got to think about that. But before we get too far, I also want to point out something else we have to do. I, I skipped, and I, I should step back. 
When we're doing a physics problem, we need to figure out coordinates. What's our coordinate system, including where is zero and what's our orientation? Which way is up? Now, there's not a right or wrong, but there's easier and harder choices. And rule of thumb, go with easier. I know you're like, but I want to show off my awesomeness. And I totally believe in your awesomeness because you are awesome. On the other hand, let's get you a good grade. Okay, so where is a good place to put zero? Well, normally it's either at the top or bottom or maybe where you're pumping to. But here, I would say, I would like to put zero down here because that's where we're starting from. So I'm, I'm starting at ground level. That's y equals zero and I'm moving up. And then I'd say, well, what's the orientation? And so I'm going to go up. So y equals 10 is the top. So the good news is that the distance we move, because force is, sorry, force times distance is work, so our distance is y. Okay, so we're most of the way there. One tiny thing left is this length. Okay, we know it was coming. Now let's talk about it. Let's look at a side cross section. So here we go. We have y equals 0, y equals 10. And, uh, and our question of it is, what's going on if I'm at some intermediate value for y? What's the length? It's a good question to have. Well, uh, hmm. Well, we can think about this. We know at the top it has length 10, and at the bottom it has length 16. And so we say, well, if we go up by 10, we've shrunk by 6. And notice it's a line. Right? That's, we see that. It's flat. We like flat things. Pro tip. Calculus is really about flat things. Okay, so since we like flat things, we say, well, okay, so... We're decreasing by 6, we move up by 10. So we could say down 6 over 10, right? So, so down by 6, up by 10. It's almost like we're doing a slope, because we are. All right, so that's our, our change. So we say, okay, well, what do you multiply by? Well, y. And you can say, okay, so we should move negative 6 tenths over for every unit we move up. Y is how many units we move up. And of course, we should end up with, uh, well, we start at 16, and then that's how much we change. So initial plus change. Now, this is easy for people to make mistakes. So here's what I'm going to do. And I'll tell you, well, this is not my first time trying this problem. I kind of caught myself, and I was like, well, let me start over with my ex explanation. How do I know if it's right? Well, it should be very simple. Because it's flat, it should look like a line. And then I say, okay, if it's a line, I just have to check the bottom and the top. So let's plug in the bottom. At y equals 0, is it 16? Check. Noise. Check the top. At y equals 10, is it 10? Well, 10 over 10 becomes 1. And then it really becomes a minus 6. And 60 minus 6 is 10. Double check. Noise, noise, which means when you put it together that this really does capture what we need. So I say, aha, good. So our slice, if we now put our pieces together, we say has the following three measurements. There's the dy, there's the 10, and then there's the 16 minus 3 over 5y, because 6 over 10 is the same as 3 over 5y. Okay, so we're almost there. We multiply these together. So 10 times 16 minus 3 over 5y times dy is our volume. Volume times density, well, make some notes here, this is volume. 20, so that's our density, and 
and this gives us our force. All right, it's our weight. How heavy is it? And now we have our distance. So this is our distance we move. And distance times force, this is our work. And so this is the work of moving this slice up. Great. So what's the total work? Well, the answer is we move up all the slices. So go zero to 10. So add up, that's what integration is. Integration is all about adding. And now we're like, whew, good, done with the setup. And we're almost done with the answer because now we just have to carry out the integral. And I say that as if it's gonna be trivial, but uh, oftentimes I'll say most of the times in application problems, it's the setup that's the hard part. And then the carrying out the computation, while not trivial, is usually not the part we should stress about. We should of course do it when we should do it well, make sure we don't make any mistakes, but uh, we've gone through the thick of it. Okay, so let's clean this up. All right, so we have our integral, zero to 10, and we can multiply this together. We have 200 times 16, and uh, that would be 3200y, 200 times 3 fifths. Well, if you take 5 into 20, for example, that's 4. So it's really 40 times 3, which is 120. And don't forget y, y, y squared. Okay. All right. So add 1 to the exponent. You get y squared. Divide 1600 y squared. Okay. Add 1 is now y cubed. Divide by 3 minus 40 y cubed, and go from 0 up to 10. All right, now the good news is plugging in 0 is easy. And even better news, because we know plugging in 0 is easy, but the even better news is plugging in 10 is also easy. What you do is you just keep adding zeros. So, for example, 1,600 times 10 squared, well, that just says take 1,600, put two more zeros. 40 times 10 cubed, write 40, add three zeros. And, well, we see 160,000 minus 40,000. That gets us to 120,000. Now, if we're being careful, we would go ahead and put units. Sometimes it'll explicitly state units. Sometimes it'll not, but it's good to put them in. And what are our units? Well, 120,000 foot-pounds. And uh, there we go. That's it. Wow. Nice, nice. Ah, what a, what a nice answer at the end. And of course, the hard part is the setup. And of course, if you don't get it set up, hopeless, hopeless. You're not going to get the right answer. You may not even get a lot of points. Invest your time at the start. The most important time you spend on a problem is when you first begin. A good setup is going to get you like 70% of the way there. All right. Well, two down. Let's keep going. Number three, find an equation of the tangent line at theta equals pi fourths for the curve given by the polar equation r equals 2 cosine 3 theta. Now, this is a polar curve. Here's the thing. Tangent lines are flat things, and polar coordinates are roundy things. And so they don't work too well together. What you'd like to do is you'd like to switch here. So we're going to switch. And the way we switch is we're going to say, well, we're going to change it from a polar equation into a parametric equation. And it comes from saying, well, we know x equals r cosine theta y equals r sine theta. So this is the formula that we use for when we do conversion between our Cartesian and our polar. Well, we say, oh, well, I know what r is. So this becomes uh, 2 cosine 3 theta cosine theta. And here we're going to get 2 
cosine 3 theta sine of theta. All right, good. So now I'm just going to think of it as a parametric curve where instead of t, I'm going to use theta, but that's okay. It's a letter. It's almost like a, the letter t anyways. It's, it's nearly like the Greek version of a t. Okay, so if we're after a line, we need point and slope. Let's do point. That's not so bad. Okay, so for our point, all right, what do we have? Well, we have x is 2 cosine 3 pi over 4, and we have cosine pi over 4, and y is 2 cosine 3 pi over 4 sine of pi over 4. Well, it helps to remember a little bit of our unit circle. Pi over 4 is 45 degrees. 3 pi over 4 is over here. So it's, it's not quite pi. You've only gone 3 fourths of the way. So if you remember your, your values for the unit circle, and who doesn't? Ah, what beautiful numbers. It's root 2 over 2 comma root 2 over 2 over for the pi over 4. Here, well, it's the same height, so the y value is the same, but now the x value is flipped. So it's minus root 2 over 2, positive root 2 over 2. So what do we end up with? Well, we're going to get 2, and then minus root 2 over 2, that's the cosine of 3 pi over 4, and then cosine pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. Why? Well, what's that? It's 2 cosine 3 pi over 4, so that's 2, still minus root 2 over 2, and sine of pi over 4 is still root 2 over 2. Now, root 2 over 2 times root 2 over 2 become 2 fourths, also known as 1 half. 1 half is a minus, so that's minus a half times 2, gets us minus 1, minus 1. Okay, so our point is negative 1, negative 1. Okay, so that's part of our answer. I'm putting a box not to say that's the final answer, but just to say that's important. And now we come to the part where I know in the past I've messed it up a lot of times, and because I know I've messed it up, I'm saying it out loud with the hopes, the hopes that I don't mess it up now. All right, so, and that comes to the slope. Okay, so here's the thing. You normally think of the slope is changing y over change in x, because it is. I would say, okay, well, that's really our dy d theta dx d theta. And if you think about it, it looks right. Yes? It's like the d theta is cancel, and we're left with the dy up there to dx downstairs, and life is good. Okay, and that's good enough for us. Now here's the part where I mess up. I say, oh, I, I take the derivative of this over the derivative of that. No, no, no. Be careful. Derivative of y. That's, that goes here. So, so it's that part. Okay, so hmm, I don't think I gave myself enough space, but that's all right. I'll, be, I'll write small. So taking the derivative of y with respect to theta. Well, okay, 2, derivative of cosine, negative sine, 3 comes out. So, minus 6 sine 3 theta. The second term stays as is. And then a uh, plus, okay, first times root of the second. 2 cosine 3 theta. Root of sine is cosine theta. And uh, I can already tell the, I'll, I'll rewrite this in a second. Okay, now root of x, okay. So that's negative 6 sine 3 theta, same derivative. And then derivative of cosine is negative sine. And then, whoops, 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 whoops. I, I was doing my product roll wrong. Ah, oh, oh, how embarrassing. Okay, derivative of cosine, and, and then leave the second function alone. And now, leave the first function alone, and then times by the derivative of the second function. Okay, so, so let me clean that up so it's not all slanty. So minus 6 sine of 3 theta, sine of theta, 
plus two cosine of three theta, cosine theta, divide by minus six sine of three theta, cosine theta, plus two cosine three theta, and negative sine theta. All right, good. We're almost there. We have our derivative for any value for theta. Now we plug in pi over four. So dy dx at, so vertical line just means I'm going to evaluate, pi over four is, so we have negative six sine of three pi over four, we have sine of pi over four plus two cosine three pi over four cosine pi over four over negative six sine three pi over four cosine pi over four plus two cosine three pi over four negative sine pi over four. Okay. We're almost there. We're almost there. Just move it up. Start plugging in the numbers. Negative six. Sine of three pi over four is root two over two. So there's a root two over two. Sine of pi over four is a root two over two. So root two over two plus two. Cosine three pi over four is a minus root two over two. So minus root two over two. And cosine pi over four is a root two over two. So we put a root two over two. Underneath, we're gonna have negative six, and then uh, still sine of three pi over four, so it's still root two over two. Cosine pi over four, still root two over two. Plus two, cosine of three pi over four is a minus root two over two. And uh, negative sine of pi over four is also a minus root two over two. Okay, so we can simplify root two over two times root two over two, two over four, AKA a half. So we'll end up with negative six times a half, which is negative three, two times negative a half, which is negative one. We'll end up with negative three again, and then we'll have minus minus makes a plus, so that's a plus one. So we have negative four upstairs, negative two downstairs. They combine together. Uh, negative four over negative two is two. Okay, so there's the other important part. Okay, so we've got our point, got our slope, and we're ready to put it together. All right, so finally, our answer, we've almost run out of space, but that's okay, they gave us a whole page to do this. We're gonna take y is equal to our y-coordinate, negative one, plus our slope, two, times x minus our x-coordinate, minus one. And you can clean this up. Well, you can say, look, that's two x, then we have a, a plus one times two is two minus one. So we can say this is a y, so plus two minus one, y is two x plus one. All that work for such a simple answer. But you know, that's math. Math, things become simple. If only life was that way, it would be beautiful. All right, well, Three problems down. We're doing great. Let's go on to the next one. Number four. Find the volume when the region where y goes from zero to four cosine two x, x goes from zero to pi over four, is revolved around the line x equals minus one. Okay, so picture. Get a picture here. So we draw in some axes. So we have our x-axis, here's y. And now we're saying, well, what's gonna happen? Well, uh, first off, we, we know where x goes from. It goes from zero to pi over four. And if you wanna get a, a sense, what's happened here? Well, it's the cosine function. We just stretched it 
and squished it. And so one thing we can do is say, well, let's just plug in our endpoints, right? So at zero, cosine of zero is one. So we're up here at four. So that's the stretch up by a factor of four. And then when we plug in pi over four, two times pi over four is pi over two. And cosine of pi over two is zero. So, so it's gonna be up here and it's gonna be down here. So now it's our cosine curve. Okay, so this is y equals four cosine two x. So we have a shape and here's our, our shape. It's a nice triangle-like shape. Okay, so we'll go ahead and we'll shade that in. Do, 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 do. Shading in our shape, 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 shape. Shape, 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 shape. Okay, good. All right, now our shape is done. Where are we spinning around? Okay, because depending on the answer, we might do something dramatically different. We're around the line negative one. So we come over where x is negative one, and this is our spin. So we're gonna spin here. So, so well, when we spin, what do we see? Well, it's gonna have sort of the mirror image, and we're just gonna have all this lovely shape there. Okay, so there we go. Now, what technique are we using? We have to make a decision. How are we gonna cut things up? Because depending upon how you cut things up, it will tell you what technique to use. So you might, generally it falls into either shell or washer when we're talking volume. So are we shell or are we washer? Well, we slice, and I'm gonna slice this way. Now, why am I slicing this way? Well, I want to integrate it with respect to x because my function is in terms of x. So when I slice, I'm going to think of a small change in x. So that's why I have small change in x's up down. If I was integrating with respect to y, I'd have horizontal slice. Spin this small slice. And what comes out? What do we see? Well, what we see is a shell. So this is shell method. All right, good. So we say, all right, how does shell method work? Well, there's some basic pieces. The volume is found by taking two pi. We have a radius, a height, and a thickness. And that's the volume of one shell and then we add them all together. So integration is adding things up. So that's our formula. We now just have to think, okay, what are the pieces? Now, some are pretty easy. The two pi, super easy. The thickness, in our case, will be dx. That's what we're integrating with respect to. The bounds, well, where do we start and stop x? At zero and pi over four. The height, well, that's this part up and down. We are going from four cosine two x down to zero. So the height is four cosine two x, the radius. Now that one, you have to be careful of. So it's from the axis where you're spinning out to the piece that you're spinning. So this is your radius, this length here. So we're spinning at an x. How far is it between an arbitrary x and this line, which is at x equals minus one? Arbitrary x to minus one. Well, it's x subtract minus one, which would make this x minus minus makes plus one. Good, good, nice. Okay, so those are our pieces. So let's just rewrite, rewrite a little bit more cleanly and see what we have to work with. So we have integral zero to pi over four. We have uh, two pi times four makes an eight pi. We have an x plus one and we have a cosine two x 
dx. All right, so that's our integral. Cool, how do we integrate it? And unfortunately, there's a, a new wrinkle. An x and trig functions combined together. It's like apples and other kinds of apples, right? It's not that great. So how do we handle something like that? We have integration techniques. In particular, integration by parts. Integration by parts is a wonderful tool if you have an x and something else which is pretty unaffected by integration or differentiation. Now you might say, but wait a second, the problem never said integration by parts. I know. It's just one of the things where it's like they expect us to know things. But that's okay. We know things. We can do things. We've been training for this all semester. So don't, if you get to a point, don't be like, okay, is it in the problem statement or is it a technique? Oftentimes in some of these applications, they'll have an integration technique built into it. So be ready, be ready. Now, the way that integration by parts works, we have the integral of u dv is uv minus the integral of v du. Essentially, you're integrating one piece and differentiating the other piece. So it's like you start here, you're like, I'm going to go this way in the hopes that the new integral is going to be better. Now, we say, okay, well, given that context, this will be the part we want to differentiate. Because differentiating an x makes it nice. One, the one. So that must mean that that is what we'll integrate. And then we have the 8 pi floating around. So don't forget about the 8 pi. We'll, we'll make sure to keep track of it. So, okay, so du, that's not so bad. Derivative of x plus 1 is, the, is 1, or we'll write as dx. The integral of cosine is sine. Okay, so we have sine of 2x, but we're going to be careful. Make sure we account for the 2 on the inside. So we're going to put a half of sine 2x. All right, so with that in place, we now have not forgetting about the 8 pi, 8 pi uv, x plus 1, 1 half sine 2x, minus, don't forget the 8 pi, 8 pi, and we can just put the 8 pi on the outside of the integral. Uh, and oh, by the way, since this is a definite integral, still have our bounds, don't forget the bounds, 0 pi over 4, 0 pi over 4, v du. And uh, what v du? There we go, there we go. 1 half sine 2x dx. So 8 pi x plus 1, 1 half sine of 2x. And then here we'll have minus 8 pi, 1 half. And the integral of sine is negative cosine. But again, we'll need to divide by 2, so there's another half. And in both cases, we're evaluating from 0 to pi over 4. All right, we're almost there. Okay, so we had our setup. We got our formula. We saw integration by parts. We did it once. Thank goodness it was only once. And now we're rounding the corner. Say, so, okay, plug in. So, plug in pi over 4. What do we have? We have 8 pi, pi over 4 plus 1. Then we have sine of pi halves, because 2 times pi over 4 is pi halves. So sine of pi halves is 1, and so we have a half. So that's that term. Now, plugging pi fourths here, looking ahead, 2 times pi halves, uh, sorry, 2 times pi fourths is pi halves, and cosine of pi halves is 0. That goes away. So that's plug in pi fourths, subtract, now plug in zero. Sine of zero is zero. So now that goes away. Cosine of zero is one. Okay, so we're gonna get minus eight pi times a half times minus a half. So, well, minus minus makes a plus. 
and 4 goes into a pi leaves us with 2 pi. Okay, so that's minus 2 pi. Well, we multiply this out. 8 pi divided by 2 is, is 4 pi, and so 4 pi times pi over 4 would be pi squared. 4 pi times 1 would be 4 pi, and then subtract 2 pi, which would leave us with a pi squared plus 2 pi, our final answer. Wow. You can even fit it all on the same screen. Wow. Amazing. Wow. Wow. The crowd goes wild. Oh, that's, a, oh, that's awesome. All right. Good. Well, a nice layered problem. And we like those, right? We like solving good problems. And we, we have four more to do. So lots of good chances for us to have more fun and more enjoyment. So let's get to those. Number five. We're going to evaluate the integral from 0 to 2 of the square root 16 minus x squared. And the nice thing about this problem is it's really clear what kind of problem we're doing here. Trig substitution. The clue is that there's a square root and the inside is a something involving squares, either a sum of squares or a difference of squares. So it's nice to know what kind of problem we're doing from the very start. Now, the thing you have to think about is, what's the right substitution to make? There's three categories. There's variable squared plus number squared. Well, that's a tangent substitution. If we have a uh, variable squared subtract a number squared, that's a secant substitution. And the last thing is number squared subtract variable squared. That is a sign substitution. And the whole moral of this, the whole reason we're doing all of this is the goal is to make things so the inside becomes a square. So all this is to get rid of the square root. Now, which setting are we in? That's right. We saw the sign. Yes, it's sign. Wonderful. Okay, so here's our plan. We're going to say our variable is x, and we're going to set it equal to, in our case, 16 squared. Okay, that would be uh, 4 squared. So 4 is our a sine theta. So dx becomes 4 cosine theta d theta. All right, good. Progress. Wonderful progress. All right, now, next thing is we should check in with the bounds. Okay, so how do we do bounds? Well, we remember that these are x bounds, and we want to switch to theta bounds. So we plug in. When does 0 equal 4 sine of theta? Well, that says sine of theta is equal to 0, and that's theta equals 0. That one's not so hard. What about 2? I think this one's going to be the one that we have to think about a little bit. Unless, of course, we memorized our trig tables. And, you know, it can take a while. For me personally, the thing I found most helpful in memorizing the trig tables was I taught trigonometry for two years. And after that, I've always remembered. Now, unfortunately, that's not a shortcut. Uh, so keep in mind that we're not going to ask you crazy angles. And you sort of only have a couple candidates, right? Pi fours, pi thirds, pi six, pi half zero. Those are your go-tos. So it's one of those, but which one? Well, you can draw the unit circle and say, okay, here's my unit circle. And then you say, well, sine is the x value. Okay, so I want halfway. So there's my halfway mark. And so now I say, all right, where is this angle? Is it the small angle, that's pi over 6? Is it halfway, that's pi over 4? Or is it sort of the bigger angle, that's pi over 3? It's the small angle. So that tells us we're after a pi over 6. All right, good. So let's put this all together. What do we now have? Well, we now have that the integral from 0 to 2 square root 
16 minus x squared dx is the integral from 0 to pi over 6. We update the bounds. The square root 16 minus 4 sine theta squared. And then the dx is 4 cosine theta d theta. All right, let's work on the square root for a moment. And we'll just clean it up. After all, what is math if not just layers of cleaning things up? So if you square it out, 16 minus 16 sine squared, the 16 pulls out. And you're like, ooh, that looks like cosine squared. Exactly. That's why this all works. It's because you're going to get to something. There's no add or subtract. It's all squares. And you say, great. Wonderful. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that the inside is square, 16 cosine squared. So when you take the square root, it becomes 4 cosine. And there's another 4 cosine. So we now have integral 0 to pi over 6. Uh, 4 cosine times 4 cosine makes 16 cosine squared. Nice. Nice. Progress. Progress. Okay, now where to? Well, unfortunately, cosine squared is not one of our basic integrals, but we have trig. That's what the goal of trig substitution is. Introduces trig, and with trig comes trig identities. And with trig identities comes a chance, a real chance that we can solve this. All right, so let's see. What is a good trig identity? Well, we don't want a square. We want to reduce it. Power reduction. So there's two nice ones. Cosine squared is 1 plus cosine 2 theta over 2. And we won't need it here, but just out of practice, sine squared is 1 minus cosine 2 theta over 2. So I'm going to put it in cosine squared. And we have integral 0 to pi over 6. 16 times a half. All right, that is 8 times 1 plus cosine 2 theta. All right. Now we're in the home stretch. We have pieces we can integrate. Nothing tricky here. Okay, so integral of 8. Suppose we can multiply this in. 8 theta. Integral of 8 cosine 2 theta. Well, integral of cosine is positive sine. So it'll be sine of 2 theta. We have to divide by the 2 on the inside, so over 2. We also have an 8. Put it all together. We'll have a 4 sine 2 theta. And of course, an uh, easy mistake that people make is this plus sometimes becomes a minus. No, no, it's, it's a plus. It should be a plus. So be careful. It's easy to mix up integrals and derivatives of sines and cosines. And evaluate 0 to pi over 6. Now, the good news at 0 is that 0 is 0 at 0. And sine of 0 is also 0 at 0. So when you plug in 0, you get 0. Nice! So we have 8 times pi over 6 plus 4. 2 times pi over 6 is pi over 3. Uh, oops. Ah, the inside is pi over 3. You have to take the sine of that. Now, remember pi over 6 was this angle, so pi over 3 is the bigger angle. And if this is a half, this has sine of pi over 3 is root 3 over 2. So sine of pi over 6 is 1 half, so sine of pi over 3 will be root 3 over 2. So 8 times pi over 6 gets us 4 pi over 3. 4 times root 3 over 2 gives us 2 times square root of 3. Done. Done. All right. Good. 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 Now, that is totally the way you should do this problem. And you're like, where's Steve going? Let's 
do it a different way. Let's do it the wrong way. That is, we're going to do it with no integration at all. And I know you're thinking, it's not possible, Steve. You madman. Well, hold on, hold on. What is this? It's a circle. A radius four. Okay, so we're going to draw our axes here. We mark off our four and our four and try to draw our best impression of a circle. Okay, so there we go. There's our circle. What are we trying to find? Well, we're going from the area from zero to the halfway point. So zero to two. Okay, so our goal is to find this area. Now, let's find it by splitting it up into two pieces. A triangle and a slice, a wedge, if you will. Okay, triangle, well, we can say a few things. We know that the base is 2. What about the height? Well, plug in. 16 minus 2 squared would be 16 minus 4 is 12. So the height would be the square root of 12, which is 2 square root of 3. So the area of 1, which is our triangle, is 1 half base height. So that gives us 2 root 3. See that? Nice. All right, what about the wedge? Well, okay, for this one, we have to think about our picture here. Now, the key observation is how much is this angle? The answer is it's pi over 6. All right. Well, if you believe that, then the rest of it's not so bad. If you don't believe it, when you're the rest of this, you're, you're not going to believe. So uh, I hope you believe it. Okay. Now, how do you finish it? Well, it turns out that there's this beautiful formula that says, if I have the wedge of a circle, so suppose I have a wedge, and I know that this angle is theta, then the area is 1 half theta r squared. And you can do it by proportions. You say, well, you, you, if you take the area over the total area, so that would be area over pi r squared, that would be equal to the angle over the total way around, theta over 2 pi. And now you multiply both sides by pi r squared, and you get this equation. So if our angle is pi over 6, then we take 1 half times our angle times our radius squared. So that would be 16 over 12. 16 over 12, also known as 4 thirds pi. And there you go. So it's the wedge plus the triangle. And done. So yeah, it's definitely the right answer because we just found it in two different ways. One way with geometry and one way with a little bit of Both are right. Now, on the test, do it this way. Otherwise, you'll confuse them. And graduate students are easily confused and startled by bright lights. And so, so don't give them anything too surprising. Uh, all right, but anyways, ha! We spent a lot of time on this problem. So let's uh, finish up the other ones, hopefully a little bit more quick. But uh, I'm sure they're going to be still fun. All right, let's go. Number six, find the exact value. Woohoo! Exact! Not like, oh, kind of, what is it? No, no, exact. I want a number of the series. The sum, 1 to infinity. Upstairs, 2 to the n, plus 3 times 4 to the n. Downstairs, 8 to the n. Now, whenever we see something that says exact, and there's a series, in other words, infinite sum, 
there's just three possibilities. We have something which can telescope. We have something which is geometric. And maybe, maybe we'll get lucky and have something which is a Taylor series. Now, which case are we in? Well, uh, we are in geometric. Now, what is geometric? And where's the word coming from? So, geometric is just a fancy way of saying multiplying. So you might have heard of things like there's arithmetic and there's geometric. And geometric means multiplying. So it means things to the power n. So when you see lots of nth powers, you think geometric. Now, what's the key for geometric? Well, a geometric series is where you add, and every time you add, you multiply by the same value. So a, the next one's a times r, next one's a times r squared, dot, dot, dot. And the answer is the first number over 1 minus r. Now, there's a catch. This is true as long as r is small. If r is not small, hopeless. You'll never find it. There is no answer. It diverges. Okay, so what we're going to do is say, okay, I see lots of to the nth powers Lots of things to the nth powers makes me think geometric. So I'm going to put on my geometric cap. Say, all right, let's rewrite it because we have the ability. Now, one thing that we have going for us, which is a very useful thing, is we have this plus sign. That's a very nice plus sign because it's upstairs. Plus signs upstairs are good for us. Plus signs downstairs, uh-oh, watch out. And the reason plus signs upstairs are good is it lets us pull things apart, separate it into smaller parts. So we say, okay, this is the sum, 1 to infinity, 2 to the n over 8 to the n, plus the sum, 1 to infinity, of 3 times 4 to the n over 8 to the n. So this is using that plus. We can do something else as well. Essentially, when we talk about using the plus, we're saying, hey, it's linear. But that same something lets us say, oh, if 3 is a constant, we can pull it out. So, we say, okay, this is really like the sum from 1 to infinity of 1 quarter to the n. So, I'm just combining these nth powers together. 2 over 8, 1 quarter, plus 3 the sum, 1 to infinity, 4 over 8, 1 half to the n. Now, the good news is 1 fourth and 1 half are both small numbers, which means these series converge. Good, 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 good. Now, be careful. They're going to try to throw something in there, and I don't know if you've noticed I'm going to circle it. We are starting at 1. Where you start changes things. So remember, how does it work? It, it's geometric if you have something to the nth power. So what you do is you find your first term and divide by 1 minus what you multiply by. What's our first term? Well, plug in n equals 1. Our first term is 1 fourth. Not 1, 1 fourth. So, we're going to get here in the first, we have 1 fourth over 1 minus 1 fourth. So, it turns out our first value and what we're multiplying is the same, plus 3. But now, again, same thing. The first term we see is when n equals 1, which is a half. So, 1 half over 1 minus 1 half. Okay, so, we're most of the way done. We've actually found the exact value. But I don't think they'd be satisfied if we stopped here. Even though they didn't say simplify, we're going to do it. We're going to go and make it nice. In the first case, it's best here to multiply by 4 over 4, top and bottom, get rid of fractions. Second case, we're going to do similar 2 over 2. So here, we're going to get 1 
over 4 minus 1, which is 3, 1 third, plus 3, upstairs 1, over 2 minus 1, which is 1, all right, also known as 1. So we have 3 plus 1 third, well 3 is 9 thirds plus 1 third makes this 10 thirds, and that is exact. Exactly 10 thirds. No more, no less. <sighs> After the last couple of problems, this is a breath of fresh air. Who would have ever thought? I like the series question. Ah, I hope we get one like this. But we just stopped that, didn't we? That's not a bad thought to have. All right, let's keep going. Number seven. And this one has a lot of parts, so it's, it's helping to sort of build up to something. So let's figure this out. We'll start at the beginning. Consider a function given by a power series as the sum 0 to infinity x to the 2k over 2k factorial. All right, good. Now, spoiler alert, you don't need to know this, but actually it's a, it's a function which has a name, and this is called Cauch. But uh, we'll talk about that probably in a little bit later. All right. So let's keep going here. Part uh, A. Four points. Find the interval of convergence of the power series. Now, how do you find interval of convergence? Well, we first say look for radius. All right. So we say, okay, we're after radius first. And for radius... We're going to do either root or ratio, and then we are going to look at endpoints. So that's our process when after, whenever we want interval. Radius, by the root or ratio, then endpoints. Okay, so looking at what we have here, we see factorial. Automatically, no work needed, we know it's not going to be root test. So because we see factorials, we're doing ratio tests. So how does that work? Well, we're going to think of this as our a sub k. So we're taking our limit. k goes to infinity, absolute value of the a k plus 1 over a k. So what's happening to the next term compared to the current term? And what we're after is saying, How's the size growing? Okay. And in particular, we want this to be small. So what this is telling us is that the next term is shrinking compared to the current term. So this is what we'd like. Okay, so let's simplify our expressions. So we have limit. K goes to infinity. We have absolute value of x to the 2k plus 2. So I'm going to put in k plus 1 over 2k plus 2 factorial. So here's our ak plus 1 times. And then this ak, I'm just going to flip up. And so it'll become a 2k factorial, or absolute value of x to the 2k. Now, this simplifies. On the inside, we see absolute value of x squared. And this is why we do a ratio test is hard to take the root of a factorial, but factorial is you can pull terms off. So we say, okay, the 2k plus 2 factorial downstairs is really close to the 2k factorial upstairs. You just pull off two terms. So if you pull off the first two terms, you'd have a 2k plus 2, and then you'd have a 2k plus 1, and everything else after that would be the same as what we'd have for 2k factorial, cancellation. Nice. Okay. Now, what's this limit? Upstairs is a fixed thing. I don't know what x is, but I know it's not changing because I see absolute value of x squared. That doesn't change with k. Downstairs gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Not changing. Big. The limit is 0, which is less than 1. Well, what does that say? Well, since it's always true, then it converges 
for all x. In other words, we could say that our radius is infinity. Okay, so if we know our radius is infinity, we don't need to worry about endpoints because we don't plug in infinity and minus infinity. That's not possible. And uh, so we say, okay, converges for all x. We can also write this as minus infinity, less than x, less than plus infinity. So if the radius of convergence is, is infinity, all x, life is good, Bob's your uncle. It's a, it's a English saying. All oh, those English and their sayings. All right, part eight, done. We're, we're a third of the way. And if, of course, if you believe the points, we're really four-tenths of the way. Part B. Find a power series for the function f prime of x, converging within the interval of convergence from part A. Now, this sounds complicated, but it's the exact opposite of complicated. Because what happens? Well, you say f prime of x, well, that's the derivative of the sum. k equals 0 to infinity of x to the 2k over 2k factorial. Because it says f prime of x is the derivative of f of x, and that's f of x. And this is testing you on how do you work with power series. The calculus of power series, either derivatives or integrals, is term by term. And as long as you're on the inside of your interval of convergence, which we're always on the inside, since we converge everywhere, it's valid. So our big aha is to say, well, hey, this is really the sum, k equals 0 to infinity. And I can even push the derivative all the way inside the derivative of x to the 2k. Right? All right. So that's our sum, 0 to infinity of 1 over 2k factorial. 2k x to the 2k minus 1. Now we can go a little bit further and say, well, 2k factorial starts with 2k. And there's a 2k there. So we can pull off the first piece of the 2k factorial. Everything after that would be a 2k minus 1 factorial. So this would be the sum. 0 to infinity of 1 over 2k minus 1 factorial x to the 2k minus 1. And that's our other function. That's f prime of x. And uh, say, okay, cool, cool, cool. This, by the way, also has a name. It's called singe. The h stands for hyperbolic. For reasons that are fun and exciting, but not that we need to know for this test. All right, so there is our f prime of x. The, the key on part b is remember term by term, term by term. Good. Now, the last one, part c, show that f of x plus f prime of x is e to the x. Well, see, okay, we have f of x plus f prime of x, well, that's the sum, k equals 0 to infinity, of x to the 2k over 2k factorial. Then we have the sum, k equals 0 to infinity, 1 over 2k minus 1 factorial, x to the 2k minus 1. Now, we can do this in a couple of different ways, and they didn't give us a lot of space, and so, but let's just write out the first few terms just so we can get a feel. Okay, so let's not plus equals. Here we'd have 1 plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial plus x to the 6th over 6 factorial plus dot dot dot. Here we'd have x plus x cubed over 3 factorial x to the 5th over 5 factorial, x to the 7th over 7 factorial, dot, dot, dot. And now we'll interlace, right? So it's like I have a bunch of things here, I have a bunch of things here, and I'm going to zoop every other. Okay, so we get 
1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial, x cubed over 3 factorial, x to the fourth over 4 factorial, x to the 5 over 5 factorial, you know, dot, dot, dot. So again, every other term coming from the evens, every other term coming from the odds. Okay, so what's the punchline? Well, the punchline, because they didn't give me enough space to say this, but you say, oh, wait, that series is just saying, hey, this is the sum of x to the k over k factorial from 0 to infinity. Right? The even terms plus the odd terms are all the terms. And this is a series we recognize. This is e to the x, which is what we wanted to show. And we're done. Good. <sighs> nice, nice. All right. Well, on a side note, why are these called cosh and cinch? It turns out they're related to cosine and sine secretly if you let things become a little bit complex, they, they are essentially cosine and sine, just in a different way. And it feels like cosine and sine, doesn't it? Because cosine would be almost this expression, but with the minus one to the k. Sine, almost this expression, but again with the minus one to the k. So that's a wonderful and different story. For now, let's move on to number eight our last problem, and finish our story. Number eight, our final problem. And oh, it's so good to get to the end, isn't it? Okay, find a series to represent the integral from zero to a half of log of one plus x squared dx. And I know you're like, oh, couldn't we just find this answer exactly? Yeah, we actually could. We have the technology, but that's not what it asks us to do. It says, okay, find a series to represent it. So how do we go about that? Well, of course, what's the answer? A series, uh, we want to look for some infinite sum. And uh, we see there's an integral of a function. And then we say, well, yeah, we just talked about in the last problem how you can differentiate series. You can also integrate series. So. Our idea. Let's start by thinking about that series. Log of 1 plus x squared. Now, if you're very good at memorizing things, you might say, oh, haha, I know that. But if you're an old person like me and you can't remember everything, you say, well, I'll, I'll memorize a few things and then I'll try to relate things back. And I say, well, log is not the most convenient function. Is there something simple I can do to it? And I know something simple, which is I can take the derivative of log of 1 plus x squared. So all right, I'm going to do that. And derivative of the logs, usually when you have a log and there's a calculus thing, derivative is a good way to go. You have put the inside downstairs. Derivative of the inside is upstairs. Say, so, all right, now channeling my series. I like to think of series as polynomials. So I say 2x polynomial. Mwah, beautiful polynomial. So that's good to go as is. But then I have the rest of this. 1 over 1 plus x squared. And now is when I start to say, ah, that reminds me of something. There's a beautiful fact that says 1 over 1 minus something is equal to the sum, 0 to infinity, of something to the power k. This is called the geometric sum. And now, the age-old question. What's in the box? What's in the box? Is it x squared? No. And I, what? We were so close. What's the problem with x squared? Well, the problem, you have to fit it exactly. This is a mold. And the mold says I need 1 over 1 minus something. 
multiply by 1 over 1 plus something. So we say, well, I can fix that. 2x, 1 over 1 minus, minus x squared. And now I can put the minus x squared into the box. And I put it into the box on both sides. So it says that the derivative of this function I'm after, it's really 2x times the sum from 0 to infinity of minus x squared to the power k. Now we'll multiply the 2x through, expand this piece out, and we get the sum, k equals 0 to infinity. Uh, we'll have a 2 coming from here. We'll have a minus 1 to the k, because I have that minus to the k. And then we'll have x, we have to the power 2k, and then there's one more x. So x to the power 2k plus 1. And we're like, nice, sweet. So does that go there? No. <laughs> now we got to work backwards. OK, what's our issue? Well, it's, this is not the log of 1 plus x squared. It's the derivative of log of 1 plus x squared. OK, so to get rid of the derivative, we integrate. So, OK, so that says log of 1 plus x squared. You integrate. And OK, so it's the antiderivative of the sum. 0 to infinity, we get 2 minus 1 to the k, x to 2k plus 1. And now the nice thing is you can push the integral through. So this is the sum 0 to infinity, 2 minus 1 to the k, and then it's the integral x to the 2k plus 1 dx, which will give us the sum 0 to infinity of 2, negative 1 to the k, x to the power 2k plus 2, divide by 2k plus 2. Plus c. OK, so remember, whenever we're doing an indefinite integral, there is a plus c. And you have to be careful. But now we can say, aha, if you plug in x equals 0, you'll get log of 1 which is 0. All of these terms are 0, because they're all going to involve x to a power, and plus c. So 0 equals c. All right, good, good. Now, before we get too far down the path, let's go ahead and clean it up a little bit. We have a 2k plus 2 and an over 2. So they'll cancel off. We can pull the 2 out. The 2s will cancel. So they'll really end up with a k plus 1 downstairs. OK, so now with all of that, we're ready to get our answer. OK, so the integral 0 to a half of log 1 plus x squared dx is equal to integral 0 to a half of, put in the sum the sum from 0 to infinity, we have minus 1 to the k, x to the 2k plus 2 over k plus 1 dx. Now, I, I'll make some comments here. If you happen to memorize the Taylor series for log of 1 plus x, you can jump to it. This is I'm doing this just because I, I didn't memorize it. But this is how I can help figure it out. And so I find it's easier not to memorize too many things, but rather memorize how to get to things. It's kind of like a weird thing. It's like, I don't memorize the internet. I memorize how to get to Google. Or, well, our Bing or whatever it is that our chat GPT or our overlords have become, I don't know. But, you know, that's, it, it's easier to, to remember the processes than to remember all the possible end results. All right, now, again, just like we passed the integral through, we can do it again. So, it's the idea is so nice, we'll do it twice. 0 to infinity, minus 1 to the k over k plus 1. 
integral 0 to a half x to the 2k plus 2. So this becomes the sum 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the k over k plus 1. Then we have x to the 2k plus 3 over 2k plus 3. Okay, and we're evaluating from 0 to a half. Now you plug in x equals 0, you get 0. So you just plug in a half, and you'll end up with the sum 0 to infinity. You have a minus 1 to the k upstairs. We have a k plus 1, a 2k plus 3, and then we have a half to the power 2k plus 3, so that becomes a 2 to the 2k plus 3. Ah, oh, that's, that's, let's rewrite it down here just so we can read it. 0 to infinity, minus 1 to the k, k plus 1, 2k plus 3, 2 to the 2k plus 3. There we go. All right. Just, again, we want to be able to read it. Whew. All right. That was some work. And, uh, okay, but that's why it's worth so many points. It's worth seven. Wow. That means we've just got a few more small things left. Okay. Part B. And uh, show the first term of your series already estimates the integral pretty closely. It's within 0 0.01. All right. So now there's a couple of things to note here. This is a series but we have no x involved. So we look at it and say, well, what's true? Well, the key thing, the reason all of this works, and it's gonna make it simple, is that part, that minus one to the k. What that tells us is that this is something which is alternating. We are changing signs, plus minus, and so, what happens if you have an alternating series, some k equals zero to infinity of minus one to the k, a sub k. Think about the picture. All right. So we think about our picture, and what you do is you, is you chop back and forth around your limit. So the error is going to be the following. So, uh, whoops. So, okay, all right. I'm running out of space down here. So the error for the sum, k equals zero up to some number n of negative one to the k, a sub k is a sub n. And I shouldn't say the error, but the error bound. So in other words, if I know how big the next term is, I never jump more than that far, right? Because I'm always jumping over L every time I hop back and forth. So I'm always within my next jump. So, whoops, my next jump is a n plus 1. I can get this right. Okay, so what I need to do is I need to look at my first and second term. So my first term, I technically don't need to know it. But that's okay. So the first term, well, this would be k equals 0. And so we plug it in. Negative 1 to the 0 is 1. And then we have 0 plus 1 is 1. And then 0 plus 3 is 3. And then 2 to the 3 is 8. So that's 1 over 24. Now, the absolute value of the second term. So this is my error bound. And really, that's the key thing to say, is that the absolute value of the second term is your error bound. Everything else that you write doesn't really matter, but that part matters. Okay, so because we're not worrying about the, absolute, the, the plus minus, the absolute value gets rid of that. And we say, okay, so absolute value of, well, all right, absolute value of uh, minus 1. We'll keep it there for a second. Okay, 1 plus 1, that's 2. 
2 plus 3, 5, 2 to the 5. Ooh, 2 to the 5 is 32. Well, that's 1 over 320. That's, that's pretty small. That's less than 1 over 100, which is 0 0.01. So our error is less than 0 0.01. And we're happy. So we'll stop. Now at this point, you're probably saying, what do I need to write down? This is what you need to write down. That the second term, figure out what it is, an absolute value, show it's less than what you were asked. That's all it's asking for. And uh, you probably should just also say something along, if you want, you're very paranoid, add this part in, that the error bound is the next term. But mostly it's just the idea of the error bound is the size of the next term. Oh, okay, we made it. <laughs> the end. Woohoo! Well, the end of one test, but hopefully not the complete end of our journey. And, uh, well, I hope it helps. Good luck. And uh, maybe we'll see you again. Bye.